Royal Dutch Shell agrees to pay 49 billion naira for oil spills in the Niger Delta. We'll be talking to an activist from Mogoni Land about the impact this will make. And the All Progressive Congress governors await President Muhammadu Buhari's decision on the legitimacy of the party's caretaker committee. A lawyer will join us in the studio to explore this. And we'll also talk about the position and future of the Nigerian youth in the face of the country's poor ranking on the Global Youth Index. Welcome to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's a very beautiful Thursday morning. Thank God it's Thursday, just one more day to the end of the week. And I'm sure you're all excited about that as we are. The surrogate. Absolutely. I'm um, looking for clear weather this morning. It looks, mm -hmm. uh, it looks a little cloudy, just a little bit cloudy uh, this morning. So hopefully uh, it doesn't get too bad or the rains don't uh, come too early. Okay. Good morning. Anyway, I am Osaogi Ogbawa. Thanks for joining us. Yes, yeah, so I would like us to begin with the good news this morning. This is a judgment that was delivered about 10 years ago, right? There's a, uh, a court in Lagos that delivered a judgment in favor of Ogoni communities. Um, and that's to say that they were going to receive the sum of 45.9 billion naira. And that's in compensation for oil spills, uh, you know, in those regions uh, due to activities of this oil company. And um, that was never obeyed. You know, 10 years later, we're now seeing that um, back and forth with you know, legal teams from both ends, the SPDCN uh, lawyer, Aham Ejelamo, as well as the lawyer of the Ogoni communities, um, saying that they, they have now agreed to go ahead to pay those compensation. And um, fantastic news. Even though this one of the reasons, one of the agreements that they had was that um, the interest accruing on those on that compensation over over the years would not be paid just as a one of the the agreements. But the fact is that um, this court judgment of ten years ago would now be obeyed, and that they would get to receive forty five point nine billion naira. Um, is this the justice delayed, justice denied? Because when you look at you know people that needed this money um, to make sure that they clean up their communities, the impact this has had over time, you wonder, is this not coming too late? At the other hand, at the other end, you could also consider, oh, good news at the end of the day, and um, these communities can begin to utilize this fund to clean up their communities and fix one or two things that are lacking in their infrastructure. Well, um, as always, I'm going to play devil's advocate. Um, uh, well, for you, it's, you know, you've described it as good news in, in some quarters. Some other people also have uh, their reasons to not necessarily celebrate this, you know, and I'm going to point out the reasons why this may not be good news. Uh, first of all, yes, it's coming, you know, 11 years after uh, the judgment was given. Um, that's one. And then the second one would be the fact that if you convert 45 billion naira to dollars, it's just 90, 90 million dollars, you know, with today's exchange rate. Um, and if you put that side by side with what Shell has made off Ogoni land in the last 10 years or in the last you know, couple of decades, it is less than 0.1% of the amount of money that has been made from, you know, uh, from those communities, um, you know, drilling oil in their communities. And so um, if you're compensating them with $90 million, it almost feels like you know, 200 naira from someone's back pocket that you're just throwing at um, the Ogoni people. That's one. Another one would be um, questions regarding how this money will, you know, actually be beneficial to the people um, for a very, very, for too long, really. We've spoken about uh, fixing Ogoni land, the cleanup of Ogoni land. Uh, Shell, I think, made some commitments some time ago. Um, um, some financial, financial commitments, the federal government was also meant to also play its part. But if we're being honest with ourselves, we've not really seen any actual cleanup of Ogoni land in the last decade or even more. Um, the promises ha that have been made have not been fulfilled with regards to cleaning up Ogoni land and making those communities um, better for the people who live there, uh, cleaning up their farmlands, cleaning up their waters, you know, so that they can fish and they can have healthy uh, water um, to drink and to also, also live with. Um, so that, that is also, you know, a part of it, you know, that I, that, you know, I must point out, you know, and say that, yes, you want to throw $45 billion, at, uh, 45 billion naira at them, but 
you know, the major challenge, the thing that the Ogoni people have been complaining about really is the degradation of their land and the pollution that has happened in, you know, the last couple of decades in Ogoni land. And sharing, you know, money to these families wouldn't necessarily answer any of those problems if these funds or if the government has not taken it seriously to actually uh, fix, you know, the, the land degradation that has happened in Ogoni land for, um, for the lo uh, longest time. And then, and then also there will be questions with, you know, how this money would be given, how many communities, or how many, um, you know, families uh, would be beneficia uh, beneficiaries of this uh, 45 billion? How much are they going to get each? Um, you know, how effective will it be to really answer, the, you know, the cries of the Ogoni people? And then what next? Um, after that money is paid, does the land still remain that way? Do these do the, do we have better laws with regards? I know that there's uh, something in the petroleum industry bill that um, is talking about three or five percent of um, you know um, funds um, from oil companies that are given back to communities. So you know those ones are also part of the things that might fix Ogoni land. But um, for everyone who might see this as good news, I personally see that there's so much more that seems to be ignored in this conversation. And I don't think that forty-five billion for me, in any way, would be proper, um, you know, payment for the damage that has happened, you know, in Ogoni land for the last couple of decades. You do have uh, points there, and like I always like to look at the bigger picture. You know, when we take a step back and compare, you know, what happens in other countries and here, if this was in the U.S., things like this would never even happen in the first place. For a co a, a company, you know, owned by private individuals to go ahead and establish this hold on communities, local communities. And it's obviously to the detriment of those communities, hurting their land and, you know, just hurting the people in general. It will not happen. You have environmental rights groups that would have shut down that company, shut down their operations and forced them to make sure that all their processes are clean. But when you come here, this is a place where, you know, people just dump things, do things as they please, you know, whether the government are beneficiaries or not, the question is, do they really care about the people? So in the first place, in other parts of the world, this would never even happen. Like, there would have been no basis for these oil spills and things like that. I'm not saying there, there are no environmental pollution in those places. There, there definitely are environmental pollution. But I'm saying at this scale and for this long, yeah. nah, it would have been shut down so long it's ago. It's not necessarily the companies also... companies would have been forced yeah, to check it's not necessarily also Shell's responsibility or 100% Shell's responsibility or any of these oil companies uh, to ensure that the um, communities are in the best possible you know, situation. A lot of people would say that, you know, if we're being serious that, you know, the um, whole of the Niger Delta should look better than Dubai if we've been serious uh, with regards to the amount of money that has been made of that region in the last, in, in decades, since the 60s. Uh, but obviously that's not it. It's, it really is the Nigerian government, both the federal and the state government and local government's responsibility to ensure that these things didn't happen. But, you know, we go, going back to the Abacha era, you know, and the Ken Sarawiwa um, um, hanging, um, those were some of the concerns that they had pointed out, but obviously they didn't play out. There's, you know, theories of what, you know, the role that Shell supposedly or allegedly played with regards to Ken Sarawiwa's um, uh, death back then. But it is what it is, mm. I guess. Moving on now to our next top trending story, it's about roads. If you're a road user in Nigeria, um, get ready to pay about 200 naira um, for your vehicle um, plying roads in the country. And trucks will have to um, go ahead and pay about 500 naira. This is a new policy that the Minister of Works and Housing, Babatinde Fashala, announced on Wednesday yesterday. He says that... Um, it's a new policy approved by the Federal Executive Council for toll gates across the country. And he basically explained that, you know, this is part of um, concessionaires' policy um, to recoup investments. And that's under a new arrangement uh, with the Highways Development and Management Initiative. Uh, remember, we spoke about this. Um, a few weeks ago, maybe with Tagule, I'm um, talking about, you know, borrowing loans from China and these other countries to come help us build um, our, our rail and road infrastructure and, you know, how these monies will be recouped. And they yeah. talked about, you know, basically making sure that people pay tolls on these roads. Um, that's the issue here. The fact that at the end of the day, it is Nigerians who seem to, you know, will now bear the brunt of this, you know, ensure that the federal government pays back and people also express concerns how safe really are the roads when you look at the road infrastructure across the country which roads do you say have been constructed you know in recent time we've seen roads have been constructed and then one small rain falls and everything just you know just just dilapidates everything just gets destroyed by the flood so it makes you want to ask questions about the longevity the durability of these roads what kind of materials are they using uh, you know the, the the skills of these road workers and really 
if these roads have been built to the best quality, I don't feel that Nigerians would have any cause to complain about these roads infrastructure or saying they're not going to pay the toll gates. But the fact that we've seen, the, we've seen time and time again that these roads are not durable, the roads get bad in just a few months, a few years, and then you're go, you're have to, you have to pay tolls on these roads, I feel that's really where the grievance of Nigerians are coming from. Yeah, the uh, good thing with this story is at the end of it, you know, it says that the ministers, um, you know, noted that the uh, tolling wouldn't start until the roads are fully uh, motorable. Um, you, and, you know, I like that you've pointed out the fact that we, we never really have proper um, auditing with regards to the quality of infrastructure that is built every now and then. People have questioned the, you know, type of, you know, trains that have been, you know, built or the, you know, the, you know, Abu Kaduna and the, and and the saw, rest we, we saw um, that, that, that keep breaking down every now and then. One flood made, you know, the railway just, just clogged up and a rail that so, should be light speed yeah. became slim so, speed. So, so people have questioned that, you know, and I've always mentioned the fact that we don't have that level of quality control. Um, when you hear that a government has, uh, you know, awarded a contract, you know, for, uh, you know, a school, for example, you know, nobody really looks closely at the contract details and what were the requirements in that contract, you know, to compare that with the quality of school that was built. I'm just using school as an example. So it's pretty much the same thing with roads. Um, when, you know, a governor uh, wants a contract, you know, to build roads and the roads are built and they, you know, get damaged in eight months or in, in, in one year, there's no questions asked. You know, nobody needs, you know, nobody, you know, gets to actually answer, you know, deep questions about why, you know, it was that quality. So, so there is that angle. Um, but I've always agreed with the fact that we need some level of public-private partnerships in order to um, build infrastructure in Nigeria. If the government cannot fully fund uh, certain, you know, types of infrastructure, um, infrastructural development, then of course we need PPP um, agreements to get that done. So yes, with roads, yes, with transportation, yes, with healthcare, with every other thing. And if we get to that point where these things are properly and, you know, very well built, um, I don't think Nigerians, like you mentioned, would have any challenge paying 200 naira to pass, you know, a toll gate or 500 naira for a truck. That's what it says. Mm -hmm. um, but once again, according to the minister, these, you know, tolls are not going to start until the roads are motorable. We just hope that they will actually go through with fixing all these very, very important roads uh, for transit, uh, for traveling across Nigeria. And before, of course, you ask people to pay for, for them. All right, so finally on top trending, um, if you're a supporter of um, former Lagos Governor Bola Amatunibu for president in 2023, Chief Chen of the People's Democratic Party, uh, PDP Pony George, says something is wrong with you. I mean, that's a statement he made yesterday saying that um, all supporters of Tunubu need to get their head checked and that, you know, he's not fit to be, Tunubu is not fit to be president and that if Tunubu becomes president, he will leave the country because he can never be um, a citizen of Nigeria under Tunubu. That really is the story there. Oh, well, um, you, the, there's always that narrative that there's no permanent friend or foe with uh, in politics. Um, um, when these two people, of course, have their issues you know, it's best to just stay out of it because eventually the Nigerian people have gotten to realize that, you know, it's not really about them. You know, it's about, you know, personal relationships and political gains, you know, from one place or the other. Uh, but the judge himself, I, I, I think I remember him saying that he was going to leave Nigeria if, you know, a particular person won the election. He's still in Nigeria. Um, no place like that. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's actually a genuine concern when people say, you know, how much did you gain or how much did you give, but, um, did Lagos benefit from, you know, Tinubu's time as governor? And if he is currently outside Nigeria receiving medical care, I mean, does it mean that there was no hospital built in Lagos at the time that he was governor um, to ensure that every other person can benefit from, you know, proper health care? Yes, I think All that's right. it on Top Trending. We'll take a break here and return shortly. Stay with us.